I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. On behalf of those present, I acknowledge the traditional owners on of the land on which we now meet. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I also pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia and hope the path towards reconciliation continues to be shared and embraced. Now, thank you for joining us, everyone. I'm Professor Angela Carboni, the awards director. I've got a small team of two that help me manage the awards, Angeline, and we've also got Jin, who's the awards coordinator. And we've got an exciting agenda lined up today. We'll be talking about writing a successful program application. We've got Professor David Sadler. His substantive role is the DVCE at University of Western Australia, and he provides strategic education leadership across the whole university. And he's always been passionate about the student experience and how this directly links to teaching and research opportunities provided by our universities. He was also appointed in 2021 to the board of the UK-based Advanced Higher Education, which was formerly known as the Higher Education Academy. And last year, he took on the role as the chair of the program's award committee, and he's agreed to continue on in that role for this year as well. So thank you, David, for joining us. David is going to start off the session today and talk about his reflections on the program awards, particularly focusing on the why are you applying for an award? What are you applying for and how to go about applying? We also have two program award recipients here with us. Ali Ford next. Ali Ford, former colleague of mine back at Monash University. And she is from the ISAP team. The ISAP stands for Integrating Science and Practice. And she was successful in receiving a program award last year. And ISAP is a case-based learning program used in the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Science. And the program is actually used to teach students some critical thinking and reflective practice skills. Ali will tell us more about that when we come to have a bit of a, a panel discussion. And then I've also got Jade Kennedy. Jade is from the University of Wollongong and he's part of the Academic Development Recognition Team. And in 2017, his team, along with local Aboriginal elders and the community, co-designed Jindola. And that's an institution-wide education development grants program program aimed at embedding Aboriginal knowledges and perspectives into the curriculum. And I know a lot of universities are moving in that direction, and that's a really good thing. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. David, I'm going to pass it over to you where you can give us your reflections on the programs and then maybe open it up for questions. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this budget, Wajak people of the Nunga Nation. So I echo very much the acknowledgement uh, and gave at the start. I'm not going to go into great depth. I think you've already Already been given a bit of a introduction to my engagement in this process and it's actually been quite sustained I think so these reflections although they're personal do have some grounding in a bit of kind of history and I just want to say that the reason why I really wanted to do this is because the program awards I think are really important and I'm really looking forward to hearing the two winners recipient we don't get enough applications we don't get applications in some of the categories to the level that we really need and I'll talk a bit about that when you're thinking about applying for the one of the really important things is to make sure you've got the right category for application. Category two and category four, we don't get enough in. We get sufficient in categories one and three. Quite frequent that we will recommend this application should have been actually located in or could have been located in another category. So working out the category becomes important. A really good place to start is the Universities Australia AAUT website, where if you look at the assessment criteria and the tip, there's a lot of good material there. So all I've done here is just pulled out the core assessment criteria and I'll speak a bit more about those. But as I say, over and above what I anecdotally say today, look at the website. It's an obvious point, but often we don't see everything in an application. My suggestion for my deeper dive on reflections is that you ask yourself as a team four questions. Why are you doing what you're doing? What is it that you're doing? How are you doing it? And does it matter? What's the impact? So what? Why? What is the issue that needs addressing? You've got to be very clear on the problem or issue that you're forefronting. And it's, if you like, significant, kind of a contemporary issue, perhaps, you know, just of that year. But it's been over a period of time. And it has significance, both within your context, but also perhaps within the discipline more broadly, or across the university, or indeed, sort of internationally or nationally. And I think 
establishing the problem is so important because when you get to the so what, you can then start to say, and in response to the problem, we have achieved X and Y. Because impact or the so what question is the one where most applications fall over. Then I think in the why is why are you the right team to explore the issue? What is your track record, both as individuals and as a team, in terms of the authority and the credibility that you've got in pursuing that particular issue? It could be through subtle type activities, it could be through publications, it could be through previous awards. And what is your experience of the issue? One area which I find is really interesting is impact and the understanding of how this aligns with perhaps some of the, the institutional strategies and, if you like, what might be imperatives at your subject level through deans of science or deans of health or whatever it may be, is actually support you as a team are trying to achieve. So this is a really important one and often gets skated over, being very clear on why you're the right team for this. On the what, this is important for a different reason. One, I think really picking up on the why, why should this be awarded a program award? Why should this be recognised nationally? And why isn't this just the university's business? We ask that question a lot. Understanding, if you like, the significance of the project is really important. Then you've got the whole scope of the question. And a critical one is the numbers of students involved over time. Is it a small number of very deep engagements or a large number of students affected? And also the unit or modules or whatever we call and one of the reasons we were speculating why programs might not get enough of applications is there's a confusion about the nomenclature of program within a university setting. In this context, it's a, an initiative or a, a body of work that's tangible rather than it has to align with a, an academic discipline program, but it can. Who's involved? What's the cross-university involvement and engagement? What are the partners that you're employing in this? This is very important later on as well for evidence gathering, but you know, are you in partnership with a, another education provider, another university, TAFE, industry? And then what is the specific role of each of the team members? And I'll come back to that point. But being very clear that the expertise of the team can be different and it actually applies itself differentially across the project. And that will help you, I think, determine in the end what category to apply for. As I say, we don't see enough, despite all of the emphasis on work integrated learning in the sector, we don't see enough in that space. And we don't see enough in the collaborative education space, despite the, the relationships that we know we all have with industry employers and TAFE. So actually understanding the significance of that kind of project, really important. Now the how, and these are areas where some of the assessors will pick up some of the strengths and weaknesses of the applications before they come to the panel. These are important areas to focus on. And I'm going to work up from the bottom, actually. I think really understanding the long-term sustainability of the approaches that you've used, feasibility and the applicability outside of just your immediate environment is really important. Is it a really costly and not repeatable initiative that's been very successful or is it a relatively successful and adaptable and there's no right answer to those questions but actually being self-reflective about the sustainability of your approach is important really making sure that the how so what you're doing is aligned to the problem that you've established up the front and the scope of who's involved in the process one area of weakness that i've witnessed consistently is evaluation not being understood as something that only applies at the end of the project so building evaluation in at all stages not just at the end and actually being very reflective about how interim evaluation has led to amendment and has actually affected the impact of what your project is. And then I think there's this issue, it's in the formal criteria around the integration of scholarship and if you like, the alignment to your methodologies and your philosophies of teaching. It's really important, done well, it's very, very strong. Some people tend to overdo it and some people tend to underdo it. I would say it's about making sure that you're using it purposefully and reflectively in relation to the coherence that's in that third point and that we can often find things are just too confusing because they're too theoretical or they're very empirical and we are saying where's the reference in the subtle literature. So these are the kinds of things that we do look out for. Now this is the problem area. I did it with my own internal team here, a bit of analysis of our own results and this is where we fall down. So what? You put this in, given a record of achievement, say over a four-year period, what's actually the impact? And what's the impact against the issue that you set up front? 
So the, the why are you involved in this particular project? So this is where, if you like, those four questions loop back in a circle. You need also to strike the right diversity of evidential sources to provide, if you like, the evidence of that impact. And this is where university recognition of the team and of the individuals through if you like, internal awards or other forms of recognition become really important. Very clear evidence of support from employers, from industry to, if you like, to other educational sort of partners or the not-for-profit sector. There is often a big use of qualitative student feedback. Be selective about that and make it targeted to the findings, if you like, the outcomes that you're trying to establish because on its own, it's not enough. And you will need to find quantitative evidential measures as well. Evidence of impact in student behaviour or student achievement over time is important. A trend rather than a spot check on a particular year or a particular group or a particular semester. And then I think another piece of evidential impact is the enthusiasm for what you're doing by the take up from other departments in your own university or across other universities, or indeed internationally. And then, of course, the external kite marks of recognition. So get invited to do things, get invited to be part of publication, or the team actually becomes an advisor to other universities trying to do the same things. These are really important indicators of peer recognition. This is the area that tends to fall down. How do you recommend obtaining evidence of industry employer support? I don't think the best way of doing it is when you're actually quite close to submitting the program application. Develop a portfolio of materials, evaluation data, testimonials from the key partners, which means that you've got a gathering portfolio of evidence that could be used for this selectively or otherwise, but also can be repurposed for other things, for other recognition schemes or for promotion applications. I think thinking this through in the long term is one of the better guarantees of success. Make sure that you've got clear university support. I mean that absolutely. It's not just the sign off by people like me to say it's a jolly good thing. And make sure that there is internal coherence of submissions. We have seen multiple submissions from the same institution that are actually in competition. And to quote John F. Kennedy, success has many fathers, but failure is orphan. So make clear who has led and who is responsible for particular aspects of what you're claiming again. I'll just stress again, reflect on whether you're in the right category. Always keep equity and diversity in focus. That's a constant question we ask. That's a cross-cutting criterion. The last thing I would say, and don't lose heart if you're not back. We award around four a year. Do take the feedback. Do rely on others. Use previous winners as advisors, if you can, before you submit, and certainly after if you're going to resubmit. But don't lose heart because there's a lot of good practice out there. We need to see more of it coming forward. Thank you so much, David. I think David's done a pretty excellent job covering some really critical points. Presentation that captured everything around the why, the what and the how and the so what. I'll just check with Angeline. Is it still four programs we award this year, Angeline? Yes, it is. Still four. Uh, Caitlin, how would I demonstrate integration of scholarship? Good question. So I think firstly, it's in the why this team, because if you've got a established profile and record in the area, and that includes, if you like, contribution to the scholarship of the area. I think also in the how, if you like, in the uh, what are you trying to do and how does this align with your methodology of teaching and your, if you like, your overall theoretical position. And also, if you like, in the findings. So for example, if you're doing something, I'll pick my own area, role play, experiential learning. If you're doing something around that and it picks up, if you like, that you've been able to engage students from a in a more active way from a much more diverse cohort of students. There's plenty of written references on the impact of experiential learning in that space. So you just indicate that as aligned or un unaligned with some of the existing findings. I don't think you're submitting a research proposal. So the really important thing is to use that scholarship for the support of what you're doing rather than to demonstrate how good you are at that particular field of, of scholarly activity. Yeah, really good point because we have to remind applicants this is not a literature review. You're not doing That's it right. a literature review. Yeah. David, there's another question there around tips on your references. Sharon, I might need you to clarify what you mean by that. Thanks, David. That was fantastic. You have to select two people to be referees. I should have probably put not references. 
Um, and thinking about is it does it matter if they're from the university or should they both be outside the university or should that what's your thinking on that please i think firstly so i don't give you the wrong steer just check what's actually required in the guidance on the website my memory of this and sorry if this is a bit hazy is that one of the referees is often the people like me the deputy vice chancellor that's doing two things one is indicating university support but also is able to talk about the the excellence of the group and then another might be someone from another place that has, if you like, direct experience of your scholarship. Angeline might be able to answer that. I'm just looking at instruction guidelines. So the first referee is to be within the faculty, the head of the faculty or department. Yeah, yeah. And the second referee can be internal or external. Yeah, yeah. So, so it will have to be one internal, one external. Yeah, certainly on the, in my own experience, I've been asked to be the referee for some of ours and that's probably because they know where I sit in the sort of lexicon of the national position. All right so we go to Rosalie. Thanks very much for this David it's really really helpful. Really I'm just sort of probably asking again about the um, I know you said to, to get the um, evidence from uh, employers early. If it's say if it's an, a whole of institution program would you recommend going to a peak body organisation with it with the portfolio or contacting specific major employers um, uh, that are known to the university just sort of we're actually looking at resubmitting an application that we got from last year and one of the comments was around that we didn't show evidence of engagement with with, um, with industry and employers. And so um, that, that's, it's a really uh, germane question for us. There's no correct answer to that question. What I'll try and do is give you some sense of my experience in this space. Firstly, the reference isn't a general reference. It isn't a general testimonial. It isn't a general, this is a jolly good program. It's got to be someone from industry or employer. It could be a peak body if you've worked with the peak bodies. In other words, the better testimonials that support the, the evidence of impact are, are coming from those outside the institution who have had direct benefit or direct exposure to what you've done. It might be the peak body, but equally it might be the head of professional development at one of the local employers. You will know that because it will be the group that you naturally work with. My point more was about doing this well in advance. So if the program's been going on for the required number of years, you've already developed the relationship. So what you're trying to do is to create a, a sort of portfolio so that you don't get into a, an almighty rush before submission. Does that help? Yes, thanks very much. That's very useful. Thanks, David. And thank you, everyone, for asking some questions. Thank you. But now what I'd like to do is I'd like to bring Ali and Jade. If, and we'll just do a little bit of an informal chat. And I thought we might start off with Ali. If you can tell us just a little bit about your program and then we'll move to Jade. So the program that you got the award for last year, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure, can. So our program, as Ange mentioned at the beginning, was called ISAP, or Integrating Science and Practice. It's something that one of the members of our team kind of came up with many years ago. It's worked through multiple iterations, and the four of us in the team were the person whose idea it was, who's kind of driven it along and three of us have been project officers over different points in time. The, the project or the program that we have is a case-based framework for learning and assessment. The first half kind of looks like any standard assessment students might do where they're presented with a case and they need to do something with it and respond to that and then usually submit it or prepare it before class. But then the point where our program sort of ventures off and becomes a little bit novel is that once students submit that first part, they then get access to an expert or practitioner response to the same task or sometimes from multiple practitioners. And there's a second requirement to what they do, which is then to do a reflection comparing their approach with the experts and to really unpack the learning that's gone on in that space. So it started out as an idea, then it was on paper, then it was a web based thing. And, and now it's kind of something that's very much templated and standardised in our learning management system. Um, and we have sort of templates that can be used elsewhere. And it, it started in one little school in our faculty and has spread through the faculty into other faculties. It's used in professional development and we've got partners in a few other universities internationally as well. Excellent. One, one more question before I move on to Jade. What was the problem you were trying to address, Ali? The, the issue that it came from is I'm working in the health faculty and that's where this program grew up. There's kind of a well-known issue in the space that students are there and they get all the theory presented to them 
and they can do great essays and write lovely reports and, and do all of these things. And then they get out into practice and have no idea what's going on. So it was really about trying to bridge that gap and really contextualise that theory so students can see why they're learning it and learn to apply it before they're there with a patient in front of them having a major crisis or something to actually start giving them a lot of those underlying skills that it's not just theory over here and practice over here, but to really kind of help them make that connection. Great. And over to you, Jade. Can you tell us a little bit about Jindaola program? Yeah, Jindaola. Yeah, look, it's a 18-month um, program that looks at the ways in which we can bring interdisciplinary teams. So, you know, that could be a, a faculty-wide or a school, but you're essentially building a team with what we call knowledge holders or, you know, knowledge experts in their fields, and you're mixing them all up. So you've got a whole bunch of people. The, the cohort would look like about 40 people and you'll draw about four of these teams together. You'll move them through five different phases over that 18 months, and we follow an Aboriginal approach to the ways in which we can start to transform curriculum, really. So there's a big push, as you sort of mentioned before, Ange, to increase Aboriginal knowledges and perspectives within our curricula, in, you know, within the higher education sector. Um, and so that's an impetus in the, in the first instance, but what we found was... A lot of, you know, the pressure that a lot of teaching academics and researching academics are under is to just plug and play, find something, plug it in and play it. So Jindola really works on building the cultural competency and capacity of participants over that time. We use a lot of local knowledge holders as well to come in and start to build relationships around those knowledge exchanges. And then we sort of co-design the curricula thereafter. So, you know, we're really proud and excited about the way it's flown. Jade, you've already addressed you know, what, what problem you were trying to address. Can I ask about the adoption of Jindaola? Has that been adopted in other universities? COVID really knocked the feet out of everyone, yeah. Yeah, but it, the, the positive spin-off for us was, you know, having an Aboriginal approach meant that a lot of our engagement in the first three years was in person and on country. Mm -hmm. COVID meant we had to go online and that was a little difficult for our transition initially. But what it has done is open up the possibility for other unis to be involved. So last year, moving into this year, we've been able to now engage with UTS and their science faculty. So they've got a 19 person interdisciplinary team coming out of their science faculty. So this is our first little experiment, maybe we'll call it. So far, you know, six to eight months in, it's been working really well. Excellent, fantastic. All right, now I'm gonna move on to a question where you can share your experience in preparing for a program award. So how did you go about it? And um, tell us a little bit about, was it an enjoyable experience? Who did you interact with? So maybe Ali, starting with you again? Sure. I will say it was a challenging experience. <laughs> it was our second, we, we won on our second go. I think our first one was two years before the one we won last year. We have one, mem one member of our team who's very, very driven to apply for awards and get external yeah. recognition. One person who sort of goes along and two of us who are kind of like, we've got a hundred other things to do and yes, sure, we'll do it. Good idea. So there was this kind of interesting mix of personalities and people who thought things should be done instantly and people who were trying to juggle teaching three units and things at the same time. Um, and the, the the relatively short timeline we had. I think the year we applied the second time as well was also the year when there was a lot of up in the air about whether the awards were going to be happening or not because of the way funding changed. So we'd sort of discussed it, decided we weren't going to bother because it didn't look like it was happening and then suddenly it was on. So we, we kind of had to hit the ground running. So we had different personalities. We had different motivations. We'd already kind of got it once through and some people really wanted to just sort of take what we'd got the first time, make a few minor changes in light of the feedback and, and put it in. Some of us are slightly more perfectionists, so the, there was a lot of balancing and juggling going on and we were doing it um, during COVID as well. So it was kind of all on Zoom and trying to find the, the times that we could all meet. So, yeah, it was a challenge, but we, we did get there and obviously won at the end of it. So it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad that you didn't give up because, you know, it's quite common that when you apply for award, you may not get it the first time, but hopefully you got good feedback that you could act on to make improvements. Jade, yeah. I'll move to you now. What was your experience like in preparing for the program award? Yeah, like Ali, um, we had an attempt prior. We didn't progress beyond the institutions 
I guess, board or team that sort of assessed our application. And yes, that was a little disheartening at the time because it is a much longer journey than I would expect. So I sit within the academic development and recognition team. So seeing activity around awards and you know recognition, um, I'm kind of familiar with. It's not really my section. I'm more the academic development. But having that support as well sort of at least gave me exposure. But being in it and undertaking it, I found it to be a very long but very rewarding journey. It got me into better relationship from a different perspective with a lot of the participants. So I'm the facilitator quite often of the program, but coming from a way of trying to articulate the program in a way in which it could be understood outside of the the doing meant that I was able to build stronger relationships with the participants actually and and on a different level. So I think that was really rewarding for me. Also just, you know, the mentoring is that was really key. So it wasn't just key to mentoring through, you know, the actual process of applying, but just some of the other little tips, hints and tricks that they were able to give us along the way, just about running programs in general and things. So for me, there was a lot of personal learning Uh, a lot of team bonding and then you know a lot of things that occur just you know deepening my relationship with a lot of participants as well so they were the rewards even though it was a bit long and arduous if I say it like that. Jade there was a question posted up and I'll ask this to Ali too but I'll start with you Jade how did you consider the impact of your program on staff and or directly with students so how did you measure the impact of your program? Yeah actually that was one of the challenges for me because our program so i'm working with staff and intermittently with students but having to engage with staff to identify the impacts that they were having on students and encourage be it you know specific and formalized research or other things that just come through the ways in which we assess our teaching and learning for me I think it was, you know, developing those relationships and putting a few structures in, that was some of the feedback we got. Like, how do we evidence and demonstrate that evidence? Because there's so much anecdotal stuff hanging around, you know. Mm. So for us, it was being really particular. Hey, um, am I talking about the impact I'm having on staff or am I talking about the impact that I'm having on students? Mm. We had a whole bunch of staff research, I guess, or data that we were undertaking just independently for ourselves and we were getting very confused. So we did need that direction and we got into a space where it was what's going on in the classroom, what are students telling us, how are they telling us, and we were able, you know, after the not progressing the first year to really establish a few mechanisms for ourselves and they was really around measuring assessments and, you know, because it's institutional wide, and lots of different faculties. It was also about being colourful in the sense that we were looking at varied, you know, first year, second year, third year, this degree, that subject, consecutive subjects, you know, if one's a prerequisite and thereafter. So being just very varied in that and then just identifying, you know, the diversity around who, where, where and when. For me, I think that was sort of the guidance that we really were given. And then we just tried to really instigate the follow-up of that in that second year of application. Great. And what about you, Ali? How did you consider the impact of the ISAP program? I think we were quite lucky in the, when I came in to my project role, a big part of my focus was trying to get more uptake of the program. One of the things we did quite early on was go to people who were already using it and ask them what was working, what wasn't, and also look at the kind of things students were doing with it. So because we've got that reflective step, we actually had access to student Mm -hmm. reflections that really highlighted where learning had happened and what in the program was working and what wasn't. So we we were sort of able to look back at what had already happened in that space and start to think, well, how, how can we evidence this more strongly? How can we collect this? So even before we were we were at the stage of going for awards, we were kind of saying to people, OK, if you're doing this, can we get permission from your students to use their reflections? We made little videos with some of the academics who were using it about their experiences and why they were using it to, to use to promote it to other people internally. So we had this kind of nice bank of things already that were starting us on that journey that gave us really easy fallback. And when we wanted to go and kind of go, can we get some more data from this or would you like to research this? We'd, we'd got that in place. And we did also have a couple of departments in, in our faculty 
who took it up because they wanted to do some research on educational approaches and they'd actually got funding to do that. So our program was the the tool they used to to back their research and to have something to research and publish to meet their other criteria. And because we'd sort of advised on that, we were able to go to them and go, can, can we kind of borrow some of your data, please? So we, we were in this really fortunate position where we'd, we'd sort of started it as part of our growth strategy with our program from the outset. So we already had a lot of things in place. So I think it links back to what, what David was saying, what Jade sort of said about sort of thinking about these things early and building your portfolio so that you've got these things ready to go um, and, and that you can keep building on them and sort of have the eye to where it might go in the future as well as where it where it's at right now. Great. Thank you. Jade, I'm going to ask you, you already touched on this, but I'm going to ask you, what were your biggest challenges in putting together the program application? Yeah, so let's emphasise the evidence and demonstrating it, but I won't focus on that too much. I think fitting it all into 10 pages, that is a real challenge, guys. And I'm not trying to be flippant or silly. Um, it's for us, you know, when you've got a, an institutional-wide program by then, we'd done five years. So that's essentially a couple of hundred participants, and that's probably about 100 subjects. And so what was really difficult was what to keep in and what to get out. And that's very difficult for someone like me. And this is where I really needed my team because I was maybe a bit emotionally or personally attached to some of the outputs and outcomes through the program, but they were not necessarily the right ones that to be able to present the diversity or to present into some of the criteria that are asked within um, the guidance that you're given for the application. So that was a bit hard. And so you have to remove yourself a bit, figure out what's critical and what's not. It's about really getting some advice from outside of your team as well, um, I think. So for me, I found those personally challenging. I will say that you really do need to make a time commitment. So if you're a busy human, um, and I'm sure all of you guys are, we really needed to meet weekly and I'm not exaggerating or being silly. It's, it's, a, it's a real time commitment and to make something into the 10 pages, as I'm saying, is not as easy as it might sound. So I think for me, they're the key ones at the moment. Really think about your evidence, as Ali was just saying, set it up, really consider what that evidence will be when it's going in and how you are attached or associated with. You're trying to respond to the criteria, not just what you think is awesome. And then um, really getting that outside perspectives and influence at critical points to just keep that momentum, you know, like you're meeting each week and it's easy to fall into the busyness and the distraction and go through the processes, but having key people come in at different times helps that perspective and shift you through the process and the journey. Thanks, Jade. What about you, Ali? Have you got anything other than what Jade has mentioned as a challenge? My challenge is more about our personalities, I guess, <laughs> within our team. But the, the kind of approach we took within that space was then, and the first time it was very much sort of just get dragged along by the strongest personality. The, the second time around, like some others of us had kind of got a bit more experience and how to work and, and play in this space. So we, we were a lot clearer in defining our boundaries and saying, well, no, we're not all going to do everything here. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I think it was very much like, I'll write this bit, you write this bit, you write this bit. And the second time around, we were much more, no, where are our strengths in here? So one person was the driver and they did the bulk of the writing and, and created the bulk of the, the first draft. Mm -hmm. One person was kind of our data nerd. They'd kind of done most of the data wrangling and driven some of our internal research. So they handled that part. Um, someone else was our kind of technical whiz. So they, they sort of focused on our, our video. We, we had two kind of um, options for evidence. So one of them was a video. So she sort of wrangled that. And my skill set is actually in writing and, and being analytical. So the thing Jade was saying about having that external person and that external perspective, that was my job. So I actually completely distanced myself from the, the first draft in this second run through. And just went, no, you, you write it because my skills are in the editing. So I let other people do that. And then I came in and went, no, this doesn't fit. Th this isn't jumping through the hoops. These aren't about the criteria. This is in the wrong place. That's a skill set that I have. So I was able to bring it. But if you don't have that in your team, you need to find that person. You need that critical friend and you need them early. I guess another thing is really having the trust in your team because the first draft we have, I said, you know, if you if it comes to me, 
you know what I'm like with writing and they did and I, I literally shredded it and, and then rearranged it and put it back we, we had the relationship in our team where that was going to work and so you need that critical person who will do that and tell you it's complete rubbish and, and that things up you've got all the wrong things and the wrong focus so really kind of having those those clear roles and that trust within the team that it was going to come together and we were all trying to make a good application even though it might not have looked like it at certain times <laughs> thanks thanks Sally I'm just going to go to some of the questions on the chat one of them is do teams generally submit a site team citation first and build to a program award or do they go straight into a program submission? I, I can answer that one, having the overview. Most people for programs go straight into the program submission. Usually you apply for a, a citation and then you would apply for a teaching award because a citation is just addressing one of the categories, one of the um, criteria of the teaching awards. And then once you've done that, then you, we see people applying for a teaching award where they have to address all four criteria. The criteria for the programs is slightly different. So they normally go straight into program submission. The next question on the chat I'm going to ask both of you is how long did it take you to put the nomination together? Jade, how long did it take you guys to put the nomination together? Look, I want to say six to eight months. And it may, like, I'm not trying to be, dis like, it might be a bit more than that, to be honest. I just feel a bit blurry because so many things have happened since, but it definitely was not just six months and it was not, just like intermittently. Mm -hmm. It was a regular, consistent, weekly catch up for months. And some of those meetings were definitely longer than an hour. And especially towards the end, you know, we're talking half days and some other support outside as well. So it was a big commitment for us to, to bring it into the application that we ended up, yeah, nominating. Right, Ellie, how long for you guys? I, I think we had the complete opposite experience. I don't remember the first time through and I think there was a bit more, I think that was a more structured approach. The second time, as I said, we kind of, we were going to do it, then it was off the table because it wasn't happening, then it was. So I think we actually started like late April and the internal deadlines were around the end of June. Mm. Um, so I, I think we had a couple of quite intense meetings at the beginning, divvying things up, but it was very much this person goes off and writes, this person does their bit, things go together, I pull it apart and then we start again. So we, we were working very asynchronously. We we actually had the opposite experience to yeah. Jade where it sounds like you had productive meetings, we didn't. We ended up screaming at each other in our meetings and getting really narky. <laughs> we, we're a team who definitely works better um, asynchronously. So wow. as was probably more like eight weeks, but there was a whole lot of background to that and we'd already gone through our internal Dean's Award and then VC's Award and then the previous draft as well. So in, in terms of the whole process, there was probably a lot more going on, but certainly the final one was very intense. Quick tip, Jay, one from you and Ali, one from you. Use your supporting material wisely would be my biggest tip. Point to your website, point to your things, but that's your critical bit your supporting material, guys. All right. Ali? Um, I guess my two would be tell the story. Don't just assume that you're writing about your thing. You're writing a story for people who don't know your project, don't know anything about your context. So you really need to start with a really clear explanation and then really step them through everything that's gone along the way. And the other one is you're applying for an award. You are jumping through hoops. That is the event you're going through. It doesn't matter how good you are at throwing the javelin, running the 800 metres or pulling a triple back somersault. If you're not jumping through the hoops, you're not going to get the award. So it's really about focusing on what you need to put in there, which I guess links with, with Jade's thing about making sure you're using the right evidence in the right way. Mm. But focus on the criteria. That's what you're being judged on. Everything else is window dressing and it's not going to get you anywhere. Thank you so much, Jade. And thank you so much, Ali. If I can get the people connected to give them both a virtual clap for their contribution. And I hope you found that little interview with them useful. Angeline, I'm going to pass the floor back on to you. Sure, so this is just the reminder for the nom nomination key dates. Do note that all applications have to go through your institution's contact officer. So by Friday 26th of August, your ICO will register the nominee's details via the online portal. And by Friday 16th of September, your ICO to submit all application online. And this is just to let you know that we have three more PD sessions. So in a fortnight on the 30th of June, we have our chair of 
awards committees of teaching awards. Professor Pete Patterson to present on writing a successful AAUT teaching awards applicants together with two 2021 uh, teaching recipients. And on the 14th of July, we have a session on applying for a Never Born Award. And that will be presented by Professor Susan Page, who is a 2018 recipient. And on the 28th of July, we have applied for an early career application. We have the 2018 recipient, Professor Christian Morrow, together with two 2021 recipients. So don't miss the upcoming sessions. I want to again thank the presenters, David, especially you as the chair of the awards committee and how busy you are, because I know this is your role that you're doing above and beyond your normal substantive role. And I would do want to thank Ali and Jade for their time to give us their experiences and insights into putting together a program application. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of Thursday afternoon. We look forward to, I'm sure David will be looking forward to reading some exceptional program award submissions. Bye, everybody.